This is a specialties meeting on sunflowers with the 1983 NFO National Convention in Denver, Colorado. The sunflower meeting, a specialties department, so if that's uh, not where you wanted to be, you're in the wrong place. Uh, <clears throat> there's three things that in the meeting today, three general sections that we want to cover uh, by way of information and uh, we hope that the meeting will last in the range of an hour and a half and uh, we would like to go through the three sections of information. We'll open it up for questions uh, after we've gone through those sections of information. In the previous meeting uh, I ran a bit long in a couple of sections and we did uh, get through the question and answer period but we ran longer in the hour and a half. The three areas I'm going to cover today are a review of the 1983 crop, um, the information we were dealing with on it, the sales, and where we're at now on deliveries and so forth, a, an update. The second uh, area that I want to cover is uh, our plans for 1984 uh, and what we're planning along that lines, and the other area is just an area of some general information on the technical side about sunflowers would probably um, be the one area that might um, be of interest to people who are not directly involved in the sunflowers as producers. And I'm going to change the order of it and present the uh, some information on the supply of oil seeds in the world and how sunflower seeds uh, relate to that and just some technical information on the uh, sunflowers. Get to the second section of the program. I'd like to uh, review what our basic outline has been as far as the operation of the fall block program which has been the uh, majority of the volume in the sunflowers and to go back as a starting point I would say in, in 1982 for the fall block we signed approximately 140,000 acres on paper that means that that includes people who signed up as long ago as three or four years ago on five year sign up Basically, starting the sign-up season of 82, we'd have 40,000 uh, acres that was on five-year sign-up. In 1983, because the, someone had put down an average number of acres or a planned number of acres some time ago, and because of the PIC program, we decided that we'd have three questionnaires instead of two questionnaires as we'd had other years. We put out a questionnaire to all the producers who were signed up at that point, approximately 60,000 acres. In the early, uh, late part of February with a request that they return that on March 12th. And if you remember, March 12th was a uh, one day after a critical date on the PIC program. Out of the acreage that we sent the questionnaires to, we received within a period of the next two or three weeks uh, responses that reduced our acres by 11,000. Someone said that they were going to plant 500 acres and they reduced that to 200 or 300 or whatever, but we took in questionnaires that reduced our acreage by 11,000 acres. Because of uh, the fact that the sunflower production line has basically run through the middle of South Dakota. The production is the key state is North Dakota, as you know. If there's three million acres of sunflowers in the United States, as there was this year, two million of them will be in the state of North Dakota in rough terms. That's what we're talking about. So North Dakota, the northern half of South Dakota, and the northwest uh, section of Minnesota represents the sunflower area. That production line since the peak of 1979 when there was five and a half million acres of sunflowers in the United States 
has been shrinking up in South Dakota, and the soybean and corn production line has been moving up, particularly in, in the valley and uh, in central South Dakota. In any case, uh, one of the we reviewed the information in March. One of the counties that we identified that we felt we didn't have uh, the information we needed in was Traverse County, Minnesota, which has been one of our best counties in sunflowers over the, the last 10 years. Out of 17 people that were signed up for sunflowers in that county, uh, I believe that six or eight of them responded to the questionnaires. We called the others, and it was reduced down to two people that were producing sunflowers that of 17 that had signed up and had been regulars in our program other years. Um, they just weren't producing sunflowers. So we recognized that as a shrinking of the production area. And uh, another experience we've always had with the questionnaires is that we generally, generally have received a 40 to 60 percent response on the questionnaires. And those questionnaires have generally given us the bulk of our reductions. Uh, for example, someone who had signed up 300 acres and had no change uh, didn't necessarily feel as obligated to t return the questionnaires in some cases. In any case, uh, in the month of uh, June, we sent out the questionnaire as we do in the other years, time so that once planning is completed, we can get an adjustment of those acres and recognize that. The questionnaires began to return the last week of June, and in about a three-week period, uh, we again had the traditional 40, uh, I believe it was a 55% re in numbers of producers of uh, 470 or 80 producers, about 55% of the total acres responded. In that response, we lost another 11,000 acres. Because of concerns that showed up through that then, we began to call people we'd had a response, had no response out of either March or July. And in the period of time from the uh, beginning the 15th of July uh, through the first part of August, we lost uh, approximately another 11,000 acres in these acreage that um, we thought had been cleaned once, uh, once extra, I should say, in March. In any case, the third questionnaire went out in, in August, as it usually does with the idea of getting closer to harvest and looking at how the crop's been progressing. And the, that questionnaire uh, dropped us another 6,000 acres. Basically, we're talking around 40,000 acres. Meantime, the total signed on paper had come from um, the 60,000 figure that I told you back at the end of February, moved on up to where the total amount was on paper around 105,000 acres, minus these adjustments at the uh, particular times that we knew them. Price had maintained a $10 level the first few months of the year, $10 at Duluth. The, it moved into a $10.40 level uh, in May, June, July, that time frame. And uh, the, for the first time in July, we began, began to see some increase in that price. And we did sell into that increase. Most of the country had sufficient moisture, and the prices reflect that. You see, we begin to see some response in the end of July, but any substantial rain uh, through the soybeans could have topped that price off at that time. We sold. At the same time, our acres uh, were contracting. And more importantly, at the time we put out the notice, we are expecting that what we had sold was 80%. It's apparent now that because of the uh, production conditions, uh, for example, people in Divide County, uh, 
getting very low yields. People up in like Marshall County, Minnesota getting low yields uh, because of too much moisture and Divide County too little. All through North Dakota and South Dakota, uh, there's, there was bad stem weevil damage South Dakota which brought, took the flowers down late. Uh, they, they were blown over. A whole set of conditions has uh, meant that the experience we're seeing on delivery now is significantly below what the information the individual gave us on his last questionnaire. For example, if the guy had 100 acres and if he had 100 acres and uh, he said that he was going to get uh, 9 to 1,100 pounds, we calculated that out as 1,000 pounds times the number of acres. In most cases, he'd give a flat figure. So based on those figures, we'd have been about 80% sold. Now, there's people who have uh, delivered and have uh, five or 600 pounds and I believe are honest and are finished that said they were going to have nine or 1,000 pounds. There's people who said they were going to have uh, 18 that um, have 11. That kind of factor is in there. There's some people who have none. Anyone who did not respond to the questionnaire give it, or give us information on his yield, that was plugged in as a 1,000 pound yield. So based on all of that, we had sold 27,000 metric ton the end of, by the end of July. There's always been a consideration since the, we've always felt that the uh, blend price program, the fall blend price block, had been our opportunity to get the most number of flowers for the organization and have a, a collective bargaining program to do good for the growers. And uh, there's always been some demand, although we were never quite sure, people would say, can I sell a specific number of pounds at a specific price for harvest? And as the staff knows here, this has been discussed before. For 1984, we intend to uh, offer the option of the blend price program, which will be similar to what it is this, this year and has been for the last 10 years, the same basic uh, factors in terms of commitment 100% of the acres and obligation to deliver what you produce. Uh, in other words, translated the act of God uh, feature, which has been an important feature and when this has been discussed with producers, uh, they, many of them like that feature. As a new option along with that, this year we're going to be signing up Sunflower Acres in Section 2 on the Specialties Contract with the option of the producer signing an authorization for any part of that production at a target price. In other words, we'd be going in increments of 25 cents um, at this point the staff would be trying to promote concentration of uh, product to bargain with around a particular price level. And so we'd be looking at uh, 12 or 12.25 or 12.50, 12.75 and so forth on up to 14 or 15 or wherever the a producer wants to place that target price. When he lists the acres in section two, he's making an exclusive listing of all of the production that will come off of that acreage. He's not giving us authority to sell anything except what he authorizes at a particular uh, price level. And he uh, would not have the option of moving that price up. But since it is a fact that in many cases producers will want to, would like to have a price of $12 on the farm or, or higher, even if that price never materializes through the whole marketing period, it's likely that a majority of the producers will want to move that product to harvest or to market at harvest time. They're not prepared to store it, take the risk of storing or whatever. 
So if, if he would decide at some point that he wanted to change that downward in order to, to get it sold, if that were the circumstances, he could. Uh, as far as would the producer have to guarantee those pounds, yes, he would. The, uh, he would have to determine against his total acreage how many pounds per hundredweight he was willing to go up to at any point in the year. If a producer would list 200 acres and say that he wanted to sell 400 pounds per acre at uh, $13 delivered Duluth in the form of an authorization, we would, um, we will be interested in uh, getting as many acres as possible that are concentrated in a range that we could go to a buyer and say, now, um, individually, this fellow has only authorized us. Uh, we wouldn't be saying this individually, but in fact, here's what would be happening. Individually, he's only authorizing us to sell 100,000 uh, pounds that he's going to guarantee. In other words, he would, he would decide what that level is. But we would be in a position with those acres in Section 2 to, uh, based on that man's target price, have a good indication that if we had 50,000 acres in that position, that if we could negotiate with a buyer that he would uh, provide the act of God, in other words, rather than NFO uh, being responsible for the act of God, if we could gain that from the buyer based on some volume in that position, we would attempt to negotiate the act of God, and if we could gain that, we would, we would be willing to transfer it back to those producers who wanted to go with 100% of their crop at that target price. The, those people who I have talked to uh, in any detail, and there's been a number of them, uh, I've asked them in face of the uh, conditions of this last year and so forth, if they were faced with that choice, uh, which would they go with? And surprisingly, quite a number of them would say, based on the overall experience of the last five or ten years, it's likely that they would still go in the blend price block. We feel that there are a number of people who like the blend price block, uh, but we feel that our expansion has been stagnated. Not only but we've been, the last four, three or four years, we've been getting about the same percentage of the sunflowers, but the acres have decreased from 150,000, or excuse me, from 5.5 million down to. Um, down to three million. Now, the biggest volume year that we ever had delivered at harvest time was 83,000 metric ton in the year 19, uh, the 79 crop, which was the largest national crop. So we are not looking to uh, do away with the fall blend price block that has uh, served a good purpose. We, we can't throw it out the window based on uh, a disappointment of one year. It's important to remember that after the sunflower seeds were planted this year, many producers who are not in the NFO program sold their sunflowers at the same or lower prices than what uh, we're talking about in this blend price pool. I would believe the majority of the sunflowers, particularly because of the uh, constricted yield, the majority of the sunflowers being delivered were under some form of a contract, and, and not a very large percentage of them uh, after that price balloon because of the uh, continued dry conditions in the sunflower or in the soybean area. A significant crippling point for us in this program was that we had the cushion in terms of, of uh, acres. Those uh, were found not to be good solid acres in spite of a number of questionnaires. And at the same time, uh, we have people delivering five and 600 pounds from places like uh, wet areas in Marshall, Minnesota, lots of areas in 
Divide County, for example, in uh, North Dakota, all through the area uh, from Ransom County and Stutzman County in, South, in North Dakota on down into South Dakota, a lot of stem weevil and uh, much of that blown over. Some, one of the producers even, at least one, even raking some of them up and, and uh, harvesting them, still not coming near the acres. Now, I know uh, that there is some um, cheating in the program. We've always seen that if the price is in the right relationship, we do more poorly in relationship to the national average than we do if it's favorable. But I believe that uh, the majority of the producers are delivering what they have gotten and the yields just aren't there. We took legal action against three producers in Ottertail County who have threatened to default. We got a temporary restraining order against them. Their attorney notified us after about 15 days that they uh, did intend to deliver. And uh, so we feel that we have um, done some good there in terms of getting some of the flowers in. Another thing that we found is that we suspect there were some people that reduced their acres to zero who actually had some. So what we did was we sent letters to all the ASCS offices with a list of not only those who still said they had acres, but those who had zeroed out on us. And out of that, we found about 12 people that had told us they had zero that had some acres. Uh, at, then as we approached those people, we found that they were either confectionery flowers or that they were planted for seed or some factor like that. And so that the, the person had zeroed out on us on the basis of a commercial production of oil flowers. Uh, we, Bob Lewis and I did contact one individual who had 148 acres, and I believe that he's delivered probably three loads now who had zeroed out on us. So what we've been doing is working at every angle to uh, uh, preserve the production that belongs in that block for the, uh, to reduce any uh, liability to the National Farmers Organization and to stay in a clean position for those producers who've done what they're supposed to. Um, I'd like to, uh, at this point, open the meeting up to any questions that you have on what I've said so far. Um, there's tremendous corporate cannibalism going on throughout the United States. And so what you have is you have companies with their same old names, maybe two or three of them that are owned by one company, and they keep the same old names for all the divisions, but in effect, where you might have the impression that there's some competition, there's control of the activities of the, all those companies in an organized way. And a, just, I'd just like to give you some examples, and in doing that, I think uh, it points up the tremendous value of what our credit department does in terms of uh, reviewing the Dun and Bradstreet information on these companies and so forth to see that we can stay one step ahead of these companies. What will happen is a company will have a number of sub subsidiaries. And if that subsidiary would go uh, decide to close up or go bankrupt, if your contract is written to the subsidiary, the parent company is not liable for that. They separate it uh, as a corporate. Uh, as two corporations. Uh, an example that some of you will be able to recognize and may not know what's behind it is uh, in the millet business, for example, in Foreman, North Dakota, there was a facility there owned by International Multi Foods that we've sold millet to over the years. And they, in 1982, were purchased by Wagner Brothers uh, Wagner, uh, Wagner Brothers out of Farmingdale, New York. Now here's what the Dun and Bradstreet, um, here's what the Dun and Bradstreet report says about Sunflower Valley products. It says, 
Sunflower Valley Products, Inc., subsidiary of Wagner Brothers Feed Corporation, Farmingdale, New York. It goes on to tell who the principals are, Richard Wagner, president, and so forth. And then it says it's a subsidiary of Wagner Brothers Feed Corporation, Farmingdale, New York, started in 1942, which operates as a manufacturer of feed and seed. Parent company owns 100% of the stock. Um, they, sell, they sell the parent manufacturer uh, seeds and feeds, and the parent provides administrative services to the subsidiary. Manufactures wild bird feed 75% and sunflower seed 25%. Terms are on receipt of invoice. That's the terms to their the people they're selling out to. The brands, brands include Sherwood Forest, sells wholesale groceries in the territory nationwide. Season peaks October, December, January. Business slow April, May. And it says Wagner has... 55% of the business in the U.S. bird food. What you have is in the uh, Wagner's is the same as Schaefer's seed. They're now the same as what you used to think was International Multi Foods. They bought Towner, Towner Colorado International Multi Foods plant a few years ago. But you're seeing a concentration there. So there could be three facilities out here in this part of Colorado where we have handle millet, for example, and we'll see an, all three of those possibly call us at the same time with interest in millet because it's all come, all the interest is coming from Wagner Brothers. So it's something to be aware of. Now, some of the other examples in regard to sunflowers, for example, one of the fastest growing companies uh, through its own results and through cannibalism is ConAgra. Uh, I, in one of the recent years, we sold sunflowers to Burdick Grain Company. Burdick Grain Company is ConAgra today. More recently, within the last two years, ConAgra bought PV. So PV is ConAgra. PV, Burdick, and ConAgra Three potential sunflower buyers are one, in a sense. It's uh, in a report that I have here from Milling and Baking News. They report that, uh, and this isn't a real current. It says Con. It says Conagra achieves record net and sales. Earnings climb 21% on 24% rise in sales. Return on stockholders' equity exceeds objective. Food agriculture offset drop in grain segment. Then it goes on. They're, they're an Omaha-based company. ConAgra achieved record sales, and it, it tells some stuff about them. This is a fast-growing company. And it's kind of, uh, it's getting, uh, it's, with the purchase of PV, it, it hopped into the, the league of the big ones. I mean, it was coming there anyway, but one of the ways that they do it is through purchase of other units and that, that set of business. And I think we have to be conscious of that. The, there was an outfit that was prominent in Michigan, places in North Dakota, that we, have, that we had been an adversary of ours in the edible beans. We considered them one of the most predatory buyers that had been in the United States. They would virtually move the price of navy beans up $3 or down $3 to suit their needs. It's called Wix Agriculture. Uh, some of the most greedy companies were the fastest to get into some financial trouble, and I can't say what all the reasons were might have been more from lumber or something else, but in any case, you probably know that Wix Agriculture uh, was sold and is now owned by Pillsbury. So all the facilities across the country that were Wix Agriculture were Pillsbury. Uh, Norb has been able to, in the edible beans, get a 
custom processing rate from Pillsbury for all of its facilities on edible beans except those in Michigan. So that's something he was talking about earlier. 